people joining us for this amazing chat that we have coming up. Um, before we get going though, I just want to take a moment to introduce, uh, or sorry, to go through some housekeeping. Um, if you've joined us on previous chats, this will be a little bit repetitive for you, my apologies, um, but we'll try and get through it quickly so that way we can get down to, um, you know, kind of the meat and potatoes of today's event. So um, one thing I want to highlight is that this event, like all of our virtual events, is all about you. It's about our, our community members. We want to make sure that y'all are able to participate and you really feel like you, know, you are able to drive the conversation today. So to that end, you can participate in a couple different ways. Um, you, can, um, you can turn your cameras on if you'd like, and um, you can feel free to come on audio, come off mute, and ask a question of our, of our speakers today. You can, also, um, you can also do that without your camera. It's not required, um, but we always love to see everyone's smiling, maskless faces safely. Um, and just as a, uh, you know, as a FYI, um, if you do come off mute for whatever reason, you will show up in the live recording of today's session. So if you have any kind of privacy concerns, that's okay. You can still participate. You just need to, um, you'll do that by adding questions that you have in the Zoom group chat. And if you have like major, um, you know, need to be in like super deep cover, black ops, no one can know you were here, that's okay too. All you have to do is DM me, um, that Meg Alexander, she, her, hyphen, power to fly. Um, so DM me and I'm happy to raise your questions or your comments and keep you anonymous. Um, so like I said, today's session is being recorded. So um, we are live streaming to our YouTube channel. I'll give you all the, uh, the link to that in just a minute here. Um, but one thing I wanna highlight is that um, everyone who registered for today's session, regardless of if you, if you show up and you stay for five minutes, you join and, and leave and come back a couple times, you stay for the full 60, even if you registered but didn't meet us today, hi in the future, or from the past, I should say, um, no matter what, if you registered for, for today's session, everyone will get an email in about one to two business days um, that will contain a link to where you can rewatch this recording on powertofly.com. Now, if you, you know, let's say that Melanie or Laura says something absolutely amazing today and you just cannot wait two days to share it with a coworker or a relative or a friend, no worries. Um, I'm sending you the link to our YouTube channel in the chat right now. That is where you can navigate um, to check out the recording to this session. It'll be posted usually within about five to 15 minutes of the end of today's session. So feel free to, to check that out. Now, um, you can also keep up with us. Um, I highly recommend if you go over to our YouTube channel that you subscribe to our YouTube channel. We have one that's just for chat and learns. Um, it is a great way to make sure that you don't miss out on events like today, um, especially if you didn't remember to register or you, you know, it just kind of slips your mind or you want to go through our archives and see, you know, what past chats we've ha had that, you know, that might be useful to you or to a friend. Um, you can also keep uh, various social media platforms. We are at Power to Fly on YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Um, you are always welcome to take photos or videos as we go today. Um, share that with your, you know, with your social network and just let people know that you are learning and growing with Power to Fly. Um, we're always happy to try and expand our community um, so that more people are of these free tools that you can have um, via PowerFly that we offer to everyone. Um, now, before we get into our next, um, sorry, get into our introductions, I just wanna highlight real quick that Veracode is hiring. So I'm gonna share a link with y'all in just a moment here to where you can check out Veracode's company page on PowerFly.com. When you navigate there, it's gonna look much the same as what you're seeing on your screen right now. The one thing I do wanna highlight for y'all is that if you are, um, if you're interested or if, if the, you know, what you say, what you hear today um, kind of sparks an interest in Veracode, um, I want to make sure that you're aware that when you navigate to this page, um, on the upper right-hand corner of the page, there's going to be a big pink button that says follow. So if you hear something about Veracode today that interests you, if you are actively job seeking and you want to make sure that you um, don't forget to, to check out Veracode's listings, or if you are, maybe if you're like the 40% of Americans right now that are just kind of taking a look around to see what, you know, what else might be out there, um, I definitely recommend that you check out Veracode's company page. Um, 
like it, like I said, if you click that follow button, it's going to put you in their follow network. And it does a couple of great things for you. But basically what it does is it acts like your friend of the company. It tells Veracode that you are really interested in working with them even before you fill out an application. But it also keeps, um, keeps you updated when Veracode posts new roles. So it's a really great way to make sure that like if you're really interested in Veracode, but don't see anything right now that really like, you know, fits you or, or you want to apply for. Um, it makes sure that that way you don't miss out on great opportunities in the future. So I very much recommend that you take advantage of that feature. Um, currently, it looks like Veracode has 52 jobs um, posted with us. I'll also be sharing links to Veracode's own company page or, or sorry, own careers page on their own website. But I just like to highlight that this is a really good place to go um, to get more info about Veracode as well as check out the open roles they have posted with us. Um, so getting us into our, our introductions today, um, joining us from the Veracode team, we have two people. Um, first up is Laura Smith. Laura leads the North American regional marketing team at Veracode, um, developing strategic and tailored programs in support of sales objectives. With 15 years of experience and through her passion for creating unique and memorable experiences, Laura has a proven track record of developing and managing successful marketing campaigns, programs, and events that drive strong ROI for marketing and sales. So welcome, Laura. We're so happy to have you join us today. Hey, everyone. Um, joining Laura is her coworker, uh, Melanie Bendiak. Um, Melanie is the Director of Global Marketing Operations at Veracode with 13 years of experience in marketing operations and analytics, primarily in SaaS, Software as a Service, uh, B2B software for mid-market and startup-like businesses. Melanie specializes in improving the efficiency and effectiveness of marketing through process, technology, data, and analytics in order for marketing to achieve operational and strategic goals. Melanie has a track record of bridging the gap between marketing and sales so that all teams work with the same goals in mind. So welcome, Melanie. We're so happy to have you. Thank you. Happy to be here. Thanks. Um, all right. So before we dive into the questions and we learn a little bit more about Veracode, I just want to highlight for y'all, these are some of the principal themes for today's conversation. Now, one thing to keep in mind here is that these are, are themes that we identified after looking at the questions that y'all submitted, but these are guidelines. So if you have a question that you're not sure if we're gonna to get to ask today, like you submitted it, but you're not sure if we'll ask it, please feel free to ask it. You can come off mute to do so, as long as you don't interrupt um, either of our speakers or one of our other attendees. Um, you can also put your questions in the group chat or DM them to me, but we wanna make sure that you understand that if you took time out of your day to spend with Power to Fly and be here with us live, we wanna make sure that you get prime treatment. So if you have a question, please feel free to ask it. If you if we look, if we touch on one of your questions and you want to add some more context, please feel free. Um, just just remember that unless you are actively speaking, so actively asking a question today, please make sure that you stay on mute. Um, I'll be doing this a lot just so um, we can maintain audio clarity on the call, um, so everyone can hear, and um, that way everyone the recording um, is is uh, you know real easy for everyone to listen to later if you'd like. Um, so like I said, we're going to talk a little bit about ways you, you can set goals to help align your teams, um, align the marketing and the sales teams. We're going to talk about ways that you can set and communicate expectations effectively, as well as some ways to measure cross-functional successes. Um, so as we jump in here, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for just a moment. Um, I just want to touch real quickly on their code and Melanie and Laura, your roles within the company. So would either of you like to lead off with, you know, what, what you do effectively for Veracode um, or what Veracode does in a nutshell? Um, Laura, would you like to lead us off? Sure. So I think just really quick to start off, um, Veracode, um, just an, a quick overview of, of who we are. Um, we are um, a software security or we are a security company that helps protect your software um, from the start. And our goal really is to, to work with organizations, um, big and small, to help them build um, a strong and advanced application security companies. So our, our, our goal is that we wanna help you guys reduce risk of security breaches, um, and you know, save time and accelerate your business. Um, and so we've worked really hard over the last um, multiple years, over a decade, on building and growing, um, you know, our footprint and how we can better um, 
scale and um, effectively secure your um, your business and your organizations. Um, and so with that, um, you know, I, uh, as Megan mentioned, I lead the, the regional marketing team for, for North America here. And so what we do is we take, you know, the, the what their code and, and the why, and we've come together to put together really fun and creative um, marketing programs that um, help our sales teams go to market, right? So we're looking to um, create fun experiences that are, are going to drive strong um, awareness, that are going to drive that strong demand. And our goal essentially is to um, generate new pipeline for, for sales and for the business as a whole. Um, so our, our programs include anything from email campaigns, marketing nurtures, um, events, um, both in-person and virtual, account-based marketing, um, really get, just getting creative and strategic so that we're targeting the right people in the right way, all while we're you know, sharing the story of Veracode and, um, and pushing the idea with them that you know, Veracode can be their business partner. Um, and these are all the great ways that we can, we can help. Excellent. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Melanie, how about you? So I run our marketing operations team. Um, so my team is works very closely with Laura as well as the resting, rest of the marketing department and other cross-functional go-to-market operations teams such as sales or services and channel. So what my team does is we, we manage the marketing technology cement, um, support the, the systems throughout their life cycle. We build processes for our team um, to be able to utilize these systems and the projects that they manage, as well as our like lead flow process from entry as an inquiry or somebody at the top of the funnel all the way through uh, booking or pipeline or booking. And along the way, there's a lot of execution. So my team will execute the emails or the campaigns, the tracking that teams like Laura's will come up with. And we will provide the mechanisms to be able to track that in terms of results and the communication on how they performed. Excellent. Can you all hear me okay? Yep. There we go. All right. So, okay, let's dive into some of the questions that we got. And obviously, heart of the matter here is this gap between marketing and sales. So let's talk about some ways to encourage both the sales and marketing departments to see that they really do work better together rather than separately. Cool. Well, do you want me to start? Sure. Go for yeah. it. Awesome. So I think for for our role and um, you know to Mel's point, um, we work super closely together on this. Is um, emphasizing the the understanding behind um, what the ultimate goal is for the business. So I always say to to sales teams in my conversations that the programs that we put together aren't for me, right? They're not for marketing to just put together marketing programs. They're to provide sales resources um, to help them prospect and to help them, you know, drive stronger demand um, within their prospect accounts or their customer accounts. So um, it's really about explaining to them, sharing past examples um, of what happens when you, you know, are 50-50 uh, partner um, and sharing those successes with them so that they have an understanding of why um, when sales and marketing do come together, how uh, amazing we can be as one team. And I'd even say, you know, maybe on the flip side from the sales to marketing relationship, I witness the, I'm, Laura, how many years have we worked together? Four or yeah. five at this point at Veracode through the years, many cheerleading from our sales organization. So for marketing to make that extra effort and really build those relationships and personalize to the sales um, functions needs, salespeople recognize that. So like it, it's rewarding to feel like, oh, I'm doing a great, I'm not just executing a program, program, sending it out. These are my results. It's actually helping somebody at the end of the day. They're appreciative and it kind of fulfills that circle. I love that. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about those relationships. How can you how can you build that trusted relationship with a sales team, especially when there may be like a, either a history of not you know not great cohesion there? Um, you know, where do you start with this? I think for me, Laura, I'll take it from the start. If you want to kind of kick off yeah. after, um, I think for me, and especially in my role um, through the years. 
in the beginning of my time, let's say at, at most companies, there's that misalignment and it really comes down to goal setting is really the starting place to make sure that we're both aligned and working towards the same effort. So, you know, numbers are great, achievement is great, but it only goes so far. Um, it's really that continued communication. And I even think that goes beyond, you know, my team and the mechanisms that we put in place and is really that hands-on consistent communication path. So Laura, if you wanna talk about how you guys achieve that. Yeah, so the communication path is is 100% like the key to any success. Uh, we actually have taken a step back to really understand how um, our sales teams actually want to be communicated with. Um, and we, we spend a lot of time working with sales leadership, with um, sales man managers to understand, participate in team calls, um, make sure that they, the, the sales teams know our names and know who to reach out to and when. Um, so we'll sit on, you know, what we call franchise calls. So our, our um, head of sales, he is all about the franchise mindset, right? And so we talk about it, you know, looking at the account and all the subsidiaries within that account and who's your partners within, you know, that are going to help you achieve and, and break into that, um, you know, speaking specifically from a land objective, um, you know, bringing in folks like your BDR counterpart, your um, channel or your, your cam, right? Bringing in them as well as your marketing counterpart and coming together as a team growing the relationship. So what's the outcomes that, you know, sales trying to accomplish? How does marketing fit into that role? Um, are there other tools that we could be doing to, to jumpstart their region, for instance, or to help them grow networks um, around specific, you know, target accounts um, and listening to them, right? The feedback wheel is ever important and it shows them that we're, we respect their thoughts and in return that respect um, comes back our way. Um, so it's a lot easier to start to build out and plan your region and your programs because sales now has that that true respect for you and, and understand why you're doing the things that you're doing. Um, I mean, in terms of communication, I think <laughs> we've tried pretty much every uh, communication vehicle there is, and I'm still learning and, and trying to figure out the best way to, to build those relationships. But, you know, making them aware, we always say like, we're the, the CMOs for you, like for your region. And so like, let us be your point of contact for everything and giving them, giving sales the confidence that, you know, we're going to provide them with all this, the resources and tools to help them be successful. Um, you'll see a huge shift in in um, in that respect in building and growing that relationship. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about you know kind of how how these two teams are supposed to work together, right? So a lot of people wanted to know if you could talk a little bit more about effective goal setting across the sales and marketing teams. Um, and I want to talk about how how to find kind of coherence or cohesion between both teams' ultimate goals. But maybe it's better to start this question with a, a kind of baseline of like, what are, what are the goals of the marketing team versus the, the goals of the sales team that might seem at odds? I can maybe talk about, I would have to say at Verico, we're, we're pretty aligned on our goals now, but there are, you know, a lot of supportive metrics that might seem misaligned, but also kind of the path it took us to get where we are today. So when I first joined Vericode, um, the marketing department was talking about activities and leads and talking about, I have, you know, generated 20,000 leads this year, you know, 50,000 activities, all this engagement, so many clicks on this email, wonderful, you know, um, activity, if you will, at the top. And sales is just talking about what I'm hitting my number, my sales booking target. Did I achieve my quota? Did I make my number? What, what's going on in that world? So we were coming at kind of two different worlds. Marketing was like, yeah, but that's to help you to get bookings. And sales is like, but those are people. And I'm not even like, they're just clicking on a link on the website, on the white paper. What do you mean? Like, that's not dollars in my hand. So for us, it was really coming to like the middle ground, figuring out what the bottom line goal is between the two departments. And for us, you know, we're a high growth company, sales booking targets is really the end goal, but a primary measurement for us between the teams we determined was pipeline generation. So pipeline generation is an early indicator for us to be able to achieve our future bookings targets. 
Some of our segments and sales have a short sales cycle, like 30 days. Some have a year, a year plus. So for us, it's really important to make sure that that engine and that pipeline generation machine is continuously producing so that we can support future success, not just looking at today and how are we doing. Um, mm -hmm. So we monitor, you know, beyond just what's created. That's another, I think that was our first step, just what's being created, check a box, generated all this pipeline. We also determined over time, it's really important for us to monitor the health of the pipeline. What is the coverage ratio look like? What's the conversion? What is it for certain teams, certain territories and sales reps? Are we supporting them equally? Um, to be able to be confident in hitting those future bookings. So when we see a problem in pipeline generation or the health in advance, it gives us that opportunity to course correct as best as possible, maybe shift resources. Maybe we have some territories, you know, that are really lacking for whatever reason, and we can evaluate, is it worth us trying to crank that up to support it even more to achieve their, their sales targets? Um, the other key thing that I think is really important that to our success is that we determine the goals for pipeline generation, not in isolation, not just for marketing, not just from sales. We actually, yeah. first, <laughs> first we determine um, how much pipeline is needed to support the bookings targets, no matter where it comes from. So if we do this cross-functionally, I actually took a little time at my career at Veracode and managed a revenue operations insights team where I was managing that process. Um, end to end. Um, but now we have, you know, cross-functional alignment now that I'm officially in the marketing department where we determine, you know, what is our booking target? What pipeline do we need to generate to be able to support that target? And then we determine how much should be created from each source, marketing, sales, or channel. Um, and then from there, each source will determine their own goals upstream to support those numbers. So example, say we need 50, $50 million in pipeline, that might be split evenly across the three sources. And then marketing will take their piece and say, I need to generate, you know, $15 million in pipeline. How am I going to get there? Well, let me go reverse waterfall at into, you know, all the way up from a pipeline that's created up through the MQL, all the way at the top to an inquiry. What programs do I need to create? to support those, how do those need to convert? So there's a lot of supporter metrics, but at the end of the day, it really comes down to that pipeline. If we are meeting our pipeline generation metrics, then uh, everybody's happy, right? <laughs> if we, did, however we did it upstream, no matter what programs Laura Teams makes, what have you, as long as we meet that pipeline generation metric, everyone's really pleased. Oh, I like that. Um, and that actually dovetails really nicely with another question we were asked. Um, another person, this person wrote in saying, logically, many marketing goals aren't strictly related to revenue, which, you know, you've kind of broken that down for us. And I think that's really great because like you said, you know, it's, if you look at it in terms of pipeline generation, then that becomes, you know, a way to kind of more, more explicitly tie it into revenue. Mm -hmm. um, this person wanted to ask, how can we best explain non-revenue goals relevance to the sales team and those in leadership positions. And I think you've done a really good job of outlining like kind of how that pipeline can impact future sales. But if you're trying to make this argument to someone in leadership or to the sales team that might not really understand it, how would you frame that? Or how would you go, at, go at about starting that conversation? Yeah, I, I would start by saying, I think Barracode, we're lucky because um, our sales and marketing leadership come together very early on and have multiple conversations around, you know, what these marketing goals are, what these sales goals are and how they should be aligned. Um, but as you trickle that down right into actual sales teams, you know, our sales leaderships, they're not going to explain these, these marketing goals in the same way that, you know, marketing would talk, you know, they don't know what an MQL is necessarily. Um, so what I like to do is kind of take a step back and simplify things, right? So what's the end goal, right? What's the desired outcome for sales and for marketing? So, um, you know, in our world personally, and maybe I'm biased, but realistically, every marketing program helps influence future pipeline for the business, right? Or helps influence current pipeline for the business. So taking a piece of that and really focusing on what that for that specific program or for the specific needs and goals for your sales reps, 
Um, what do they want the desired outcome to be? So I, I'll, ta- I'll have conversations with sales reps around, you know, they're brand new to the region. They really need to jumpstart the region. They don't have enough network um, networks in region right now. How do they grow and develop that? Well, that's a very different desired outcome and not necessarily going to tie back to metrics and, and marketing goals. But what can we do to create um, the opportunity for them to grow those networks and to grow those relationships so that down down the line, they are able to, to generate pipeline. Um, so um, a big focus for, for our team and for the programs that we push out to sales and when we do have these conversations with sales is really around generating pipeline for them. And so these programs are going to help influence and we're touching these accounts, which is essentially going to help influence and hopefully generate those pipeline um, goals for them. So, um, you know, I'll, we always look through throughout the funnel and um, how we optimize those campaigns, those programs based on those needs. Um, but to be perfectly honest, I think if we tried to break down the data, um, it would be very confusing and overwhelming to our sales teams. And so um, the, the best um, advice I can give people is just keep it as simple as possible. Bottom line is the most important thing. And sales doesn't care how they get to their number they just want to get to their number yeah that's a that was a a, something I was going to ask about is like when you you said that you know if if they don't really understand some of the terms or some of the goals that that are the priorities that marketing has you know I how how much of that how much of the terminology do you think is required like that really does need to be understood um, to kind of get on board with stuff. Do you think that it's just as simple as tying it into their, their numbers and saying, you don't need to know how the, how the sausage gets made, or (laughs) is it really more about like, Hey, if you have a baseline understanding of these three things, then you'll have a much easier time understanding where we're coming from or like communicating to us. If you don't think something is going to work for either. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I feel definitely a baseline understanding, um, just, I would tread lightly with that as well. Um, You know, depending on who you're working with, they could, they could try to really focus their energy on understanding the definitions of what your funnel looks like or what an MQL stands for and what that means. And then they focus all of their energy on the wrong area. So, um, you know, what reports are you not pulling for me? Or like, how do I get, why am I not getting alerts for these, these high scored leads? Or why are these high scored leads going into my queue? I don't understand. And then instead of them focusing, focusing on how they can take the leads that are coming into these campaigns and converting them. They're focused on the reporting or like understanding what the definition is. Um, and then, you know, a month later, we co- they come back to us and say like, none of these leads converted. Why? And we, you know, we have to take a step back and explain like, you know, it's taking a look at the campaign um, in, in detail and understanding that like this program happened you know, two weeks ago, but it doesn't mean you should not do your follow up and, and use those leads and use the campaign as a resource when you're doing your, your daily cadence and your outreach. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about cross-functional goals. Now, can um, we had a, a, a lot of people that wanted tips for how, how helping kind of redefine these. Can we talk to start with a little bit about what a cross-functional goal might be um, across these teams? Like how, how, how a goal goes from being just important to one side to being important to both? Sure. Um, so I feel like it's really going to be the theme of the afternoon, but really for us, we determine what is the most important goal that we've talked about is pipeline generation. So it's not the only metric that we talk about, but really we, we've gotten together through the years with, you know, sales leaders, marketing leaders, and keep coming back to this is the metric that is critical for our success and really the handoff between the departments. So rather than market, you know, we thought about going the extra mile to say marketing is responsible for a certain amount of bookings to source amount of bookings, but then create some kind of contention between, well, why aren't you converting my leads so I can get credit for the bookings? And it's really, that was not going to achieve the behavior that we wanted. So instead of doing that, we went toward, we've decided to go towards a path of just cross-functionally working together between marketing, sales, and channel. Um, So as Laura mentioned, we have business development reps, BDRs. They technically sit in our marketing department. 
um, but they are encouraged to work closely with the channel reps as well and sales in order to make the most success out of an opportunity or an expansion as possible rather than kind of fighting for credit, if you will. So while we talk about okay. sourcing, <laughs> it's important for us to make sure we don't step on toes of what behavior we actually want in place. So it is a little bit of a balance, but I think we've, you know, the past two years, we've come to a good place of this is to keep us, you know, on track and have visibility to what's coming from where, but it's not to say, well, you're doing a bad job, not sourcing your own. We do understand that we're working as a unit to, to achieve those. So from there, you know, drive, determining that that we keep coming back to that pipeline, it's figuring out what are the supportive metrics around it. And kind of like what Laura was talking about, like there's a lot of things along the way, but we actually, we really don't involve sales or marketing with sales when it comes to those upper level supportive markets, because it just hasn't seemed to be driving the right focus as, as necessary. So I think that probably has tips a hat to the trust and the relationships that we've built, especially the leadership ranks, you know, at the top, our SVP, uh, our CMO, our, our chiefs, all the way through, you know, middle management and the representative level that, you know, we're, we're trusting each other that we're going towards the the ultimate end goal, um, you know, and if things aren't, that's where evaluation comes into time, like where we have, you know, a lot deeper conversations to say like, well, I'm not getting what I need. So let's talk about the programs you're running and really try to figure out how do we, you know, improve our efforts. Okay. Now, when it comes to those, um, those conflicts or like, if there's a goal that's not being met, how, how do, you know, is it, is it far more common that the person that's, that's upset about the goal not being met is going to be the one that starts the conversation. So it kind of starts off on like a blaming front, or is there a way to maybe short circuit that? I think we, you know, nothing's perfect. There's definitely going to be, you know, a little bit of blaming or complaining, but I think um, our communication strategy really helps continue that open dialect so it doesn't bubble up to a point where it's like a heated contention. So we have, you know, a variety of communication paths across the teams, like for from the funnel and pipeline generation perspective, there's a monthly meeting held with all the sources, channel marketing and sales leaderships um, that review what's going on across the business. We can see the success of our conversions, the success, the success of our volume throughout the funnel, through opportunity creation, um, and be able to have conversations of where are our problem areas, where are things on track, how do we do more of what's good, how do we write the ship where it's bad, as well as, Laura, you want to talk about maybe your communication, like those things that you have? Mm, yeah, I mean, it, you know, hopping on monthly um, things with, with the managers, right, going down to the manager level, um, having monthly things with, with the SVP, um, it allows us to really uh, dive in. So, you know, I'll straight up every time I meet with our RVPs um, and our, our SVP um, from North America, you know, where are we struggling right now? Um, where are we low on pipeline? Where do we need um, to make sure that we're putting a little added support? Um, and it, that allows us to stay ahead of it, right? So it shouldn't ever bubble up because we're making those pivots in real time based on those conversations. So I think, you know, I think the common theme here is, is it's all about that relationship that you have with sales and that communication style. So um, we have a pretty open and honest communication and and, you know, I think Mel and I are, we're very lucky in the sense that our sales team supports and understands what marketing is trying to strive to do and how it supports them at the end of the day. And so they want to work with us, not against us. And I think that's super important um, in allowing us to, to kind of, you know, make those pivots where we need to, or come up with a, a creative pilot or solution that maybe will help, you know, uh, redirect or refocus, um, you know, somewhere else. Okay. I have to say at Veracode, we're, we're a very agile organization. We've had, you know, lots of, you know, changes due to the economy and the pandemic world, but sales structure, leadership, there's, you know, strategies go to market, what have you. And I think it's just really, you know, we're able to bounce back and pivot quickly by just understanding that we're all in this together and 
making sure to identify, well, what's the next goal? What are we trying to achieve? And just kind of shifting focus together and keeping that consistent communication. Um, all right, so now that we've talked a little bit about some of those cross-functional goals, how, how, how difficult is it to really redefine those goals once you've, you've kind of brought them all together or you have you know, teams meeting together and saying, here's our goals and here's our goal. Here's, you know, see what, what way we can put them together. Um, this person wrote in saying, it's so hard for both teams to align and design common goals, but it's even harder to change them on the fly. Um, so is this something that y'all have experience with? And if so, how have you handled it? Yeah, I will say, you know, upfront. So we plan annually for our targets um, across marketing and sales. And we spend a good quarter before the new year really going through cycles. I, I've managed it for the past five years, um, determining what we need to achieve throughout like the sale, the marketing and sales funnel in, toward, in order to support the next year's bookings targets and playing around with scenarios based on conversion rates or, you know, the headcount, the pipe, the territories that we have, what's the structure look like, what kind of resources do teams like Laura's have in order, you know, we could say everything should come from marketing, but marketing doesn't have the budget to, you know, produce everything. So really being upfront in that and plan and talking about putting everything on the table of why we are making the decisions to target the way we are. But then, like we talked about, monthly having those reviews gives us that opportunity to start, you know, expressing if there's something we need to pivot. So we're actually kind of going through that right now, to be honest. So this fiscal, our fiscal year started in April. So we're not on a calendar year cycle. Our sales structure changed. We have a, a great new head of sales that came in place, made some tweaks in the structure of our sales organization um, during the month of our new year. So there was quite a lot of pivoting on the fly to be able to rejigger what those targets were originally, but we agreed to a quarterly and half year, a, a very formal half year review, which is actually coming up next month to say, are things working that they, the way we expected and do we need to pivot for the second half of the year? So we kind of gave ourselves a checkpoint to say, let's let things settle. Let's let the dust settle during the first, you know, five months that we had this structure, obviously watching it closely. So if something really, really went bad, we could pivot as needed, but giving us an opportunity to sit back, evaluate it. Um, so I don't have the, 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 the other side to report on yet, but I, I will in a, about a month and a half. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll well, add to that. We'll be able to have you back in the, and kind of review that a little bit. Um, I'll, or what I'll add you? to that. Um, you know, maybe at a level down. So um, specifically from the regional team, um, because we we plan based off of the needs of the regions and the, the current landscape, right? So as Mel mentioned, yes, we plan um, yearly, right? And, and we have a planning process and we put in, you know, the main, the, the main programs that we're going to push, understand what goals we have to, to achieve. Um, but my team specifically, um, we will we will plan out um, a first half, second half, so that it allows us to make those quarterly pivots. Um, and then, you know, through feedback, through the feedback loop, attending QBRs, and really getting an uh, understanding of has the landscape changed in your region? Should we be focusing on a on a different, um, you know, vertical, for instance, or should we be focused on a different message um, or, or theme based off of what they're hearing? Um, you know what our BDRs are hearing when they're outreaching, what our sales reps are hearing from their customers, um, we're able to make those quick pivots. So we may like earmark, hey, we know we're going to do a roundtable program in the month of October, but we won't, we'll work with vendors specifically that um, gives us the flexibility to make those changes if needed. So we might not, you know, tie, we might not uh, confirm a, a specific region that we're targeting until we have a true understanding of what the, the region landscape is, is shaping up to be. Okay. Something um, I thought of after uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> my memory, um, what is that I feel like some organizations and I've been in them in the past too, where you have a goal and you have to hit your goal. You have an inquiry, you know, a top of fun, goal, you have to hit that number. If you don't, then you, there's negative connotation through it. But I think our leadership does, in marketing does a really great job of 
understanding those are goals, but those are goals to achieve an end goal, which is our pipeline generation and therefore book translation into bookings. So if we need to pivot along the way, you're not going to be penalized if you have to make some tweaks to your dials and ultimately maybe you don't hit a number along the way. But if you're making those optimizations and those pivots in alignment to achieve the end goal, then that is 100% supported. Oh, okay. No, I love that. Um, all right, so we only have about, we've got a little over 15 minutes left in the session, um, but we want to save some time at the end to talk more about Veracode in a little more detail. So if you have a question that you'd like to ask, please, please feel free to, um, to send it into the Zoom chat. Um, the only thing I've seen so far is some, uh, someone had asked, how can a specific marketing analysis be linked to an active sales funnel? Um, which I, you know, full disclosure, do not understand the question, but it does sound pretty interesting. Um, so uh, would either of you like to tackle that? Sure can. Yep. No. This one's, I think, in, in my wheelhouse. So we are, I will have to say we're pretty good um, for the size and budget of our our organization organization, we have visibility. So we use Marketo as our marketing automation tool and Salesforce is our CRM. And we have regimented processes to track the leads through the funnel and opportunity life cycle to bookings um, and also track those back to campaigns. So we use, um, we follow serious decisions, best practices when we developed our funnel processes. Um, and we essentially will we'll track that behavior along the way. We can say, you know, how, what is getting stuck? What is not converting from maybe a marketing qualified lead? And then on once it's through the funnel, the top of the funnel, mid funnel, and enters into the opportunity life cycle, we have a lot of mechanisms in Salesforce to track where it is in that journey, but as well as tie them back to campaign. So our campaign attribution reporting is fueled by um, a system called Full Circle Insights that's a plugin in our Salesforce CRM that helps us really easily understand the impact a campaign has had on the funnel, on pipeline influence, or bookings influence. Ooh, okay, cool. And thank you so much for asking that question. Um, it looks like uh, Demac Amir at, uh, asked that. So thank you for submitting that question. Um, we're not gonna be able to get through all the questions that we had pre-selected for today's session. So I just wanna try and see if we can hit some high points in here. Um, let's see. Okay, one person had asked if you could share tips for effective communication across teams. Um, they asked, would you suggest weekly syncs um, between both teams or a different flow in which you could share your updates quickly and make sure the other party understands the value of them. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that. Like, how do you keep everybody in the loop without feeling like you're in endless meetings or mm -hmm. feeling like, you know, you're trying to err on the side of less meetings to like, you know, le less meetings to clutter everyone's day, but then there's less understanding and less like communication between the teams. Um, so what, have you, have you all like, you know, taken different stances on this in the past? What has worked for you? Um, you know, kind of anything along those lines. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely still, you know, there's no golden um, solution to, to effective communication. There's always going to be sales, um, you know, members that don't like to read emails or don't respond to, you know, your Slack, for instance, but um, I am a firm believer that over communication is, is the key to getting everything across. So even if you feel like it seems too much, it probably isn't because most of the time sales are going to, you know, skim through an email. So I suggest, um, you know, doing, um, making sure. So from a, a leadership standpoint, having monthly reviews and meetings with, with your leadership counterparts, I think is super important. Um, the more they're bought into what you're working on, um, the more likely they're going to communicate down to their teams. So making sure that they have a 100% understanding of what your programs are, what you're doing and what um, your focus is, is going to be like month over month. In addition to that, setting up weekly, bi-weekly or monthly syncs with the rep 
the individual rep. So um, an example on, on my team specifically is, is I have a regional marketing manager that owns the West region and one that owns the East region. And so it's, it's their responsibility to communicate with their individual sales reps on how they'd like to set up those meetings. Some reps are very much, you know, give me the, the most important information when it's needed and we can set up time um, like ad hoc, but others are, let's meet weekly, let's bring in our BDR counterparts, let's bring in, you know, that franchise um, so that we can all work together from the get-go. Um, sometimes that turns into bi-weekly, whatever. There's no, you know, one formula that works better, better than the other. It's whatever um, you and your sales org or team has decided is the most effective. In addition to that, I think it's important that even though you feel like you're writing these like very long, or at least I do, I feel like I'm writing these like these summary, these long chapters, right? To send out everything because there's so many things and we're trying to provide them with as much tools and resources as we possibly can still send those emails out. So if we're, if we're promoting a campaign, um, so to kick off, you know, an ABM program that I'm working on, I do a launch email and then I actually do, you know, weekly and bi-weekly updates to provide them with highlights of what's going on to uh, provide them with additional resources. If it's an event that you're trying to push in front and get, you know, our, the sales teams to, to register people, um, we'll do, you know, an event alert email and then we do a reminder email about two weeks in advance. And then the week of we, we do a last ditch email bullet points work great, right? So you know sales aren't going to read every little detail. So bullet point the main ones. I'll highlight in like bold things that I want them to pay the most attention to. Um, and then, you know, using communication tools like Slack. So we have a Slack, um, we use Slack here at Barracode. And so we've actually created like Slack channels. So, you know, we have a land campaigns like update slack channel where all of the sales teams are on that and so you can slack them you can slack individual reps if you need to um we've created an abm channel there's a you know so, so there's a variety of ways sales teams typically have their team channels so getting on that so you can there's another way that you can provide you know added communication but never think you're over communicating um, because chances are someone's not reading or listening to what you have to say. So what people aren't taking in absolutely every second and are wrapped with attention on like four page emails. Come on. I'd also add that, that Laura, I think you and your team do a really great job of this is determining your sales champions because, you know, they're a competitive organization. Not everybody's going to step up to the plate. Like I'm thinking of Alice, your direct mail and, yeah. and target approach. Um, not, it's not going to work for everybody, but if they're seeing success and hearing actual success from their peers and somebody on their team, and you can get that person to talk about it and really like support you, it starts to trickle, yeah. trickle down and um, see that success across the team. Yeah, setting up those um, office hours too is another great um, option, right? And and use to Mel's point, using the 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 champion, right? So we'll you we'll stick with the Alice example. Um, I'll actually call out those champions and in like a meeting or in these office hours, be like, tell me about what you did that was so successful, and then it kind of puts this like it it feeds the fire, right? And others want to have that success too, and and um and and you know, in the end, what we'll even try to do is, is like a friendly competition, right? Like East first West, who's going to get the most people to register, who's going to get the most meetings to attend the next conference. Um, you'd be surprised that, that it feeds the fire and it gets reps like really amped up about the program. And yeah. um, they pay closer attention to, to the communication about the program and the resources that you're actually offering. Yeah, no, I, that makes total sense. Um, Okay, so one more question before we, we jump in and talk a little more about Veracode. Um, this person had asked, how can we make sure both teams are sharing the same messaging when speaking with clients or speaking out to potential leads? Um, some months ago, we changed the company's values and mission, but I often see the sales team using the old wording. It's not the worst mistake, but it's important for the company to share a common message. So I liked this question because, yeah, the person was you know pretty pretty realistic about the fact that it's not the worst thing you could be doing, but it's really easy for something like a, you know, a, a rift like this to snowball into a much greater difference between what the messaging is supposed to be or what the messaging is from one team versus the other. 
So how how have you have you run into this in the past, or how have you how would you suggest handling it? Yeah, for yeah. sure. I think um, it's, you're, we're going to continuously run into it, right? Um, like I, I've joked with with um, with folks, even as simple as not using the most up to date um, PowerPoint presentation, right? So we we just we recently went through a rebrand, re and um, in like a last month's QBR on a team, they were all using like two. Uh, QBR decks ago. And, you know, so I made a joke and kind of called it out and tried to make it fun. Um, but uh, I think bear code's super lucky. Um, I, and I think the key to that too is, is making sure you're aligned with your product and enablement teams. Um, they're the ones that really drive the messaging. Bear code's done a, a tremendous job um, enabling and providing tools that help enable our sales reps. Um, you know, whether it's trainings or um, updated documentation, um, we have sales workshops, we have uh, biweekly, you know, lunch and learns, we call them Vera TV. Um, it's just, it's a great way for you, for, for us to reiterate, hey, this is the importance and updated messaging, you should be pitching it this way. Um, in my experience too, sales is always looking for updated messaging. They want to um, have the latest and greatest, especially when it comes to, you know, your competitive intel or, um, you know, new, new sales themes that are going on. If we're trying to push like a new product or service, they, they want that most up-to-date um, messaging. I think it's making sure that it's, it's easily accessible for them so that it's like a drop and go or a click and play. So um, we, we have, you know, internal um, landing pages that allow, allow us to do that. So we share things on um, like a, our seismic page and it, it's, it's a, you know, they click right into it and they, they basically have a one, two, three step. They know what to do. We use tools like sales loft. So we set up templates for them and make it as easy as possible. So it's really just copying and pasting. Um, and we found success there. It's definitely not foolproof and there's still things that we can continue to do to, to help sales understand that it's important to keep up with the latest messaging and what we're trying to push. Um, but I think Veracode's done a pretty good job. Excellent, okay. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna see if, uh, if we can share um, the last two slides in our deck here. Um, I wanna highlight for everybody um, what you're seeing on your screen is a, um, a, it's a set of questions that we had posed to Laura and Melanie um, prior to today's session. So um, one of the things we talked about is, you know, the company culture. You, you all described it as very collaborative. Let's talk more about your favorite part about working at Veracode. Um, Melanie, do you want to start us here? Sure. I, th I think it really, really, sorry. Um, it exemplifies that collaborative spirit. Um, so one of my favorite things about working here is the people I work with. Um, I typically will, will call it a family. I got married a couple years ago and had a bear code table at my wedding. Um, and so that collective support within the teams and working with such great peers, you know, we're working towards the same outcome, but we support each other and we're in it together. Like we, we celebrate successes. There is not really, you know, a lot of politics and blaming going on and it just makes it a much like a very positive environment to work um, and know that, you know, you can, you can try something, you can fail. Um, if you need help, you can ask for help. It's not a, you know, rigid environment. Awesome. Uh, Laura, would you agree with this? A hundred percent. I think that's probably one of the main reasons why I even came to, to Veracode. I was, um, I had a, an old colleague that referred me and that's what sold me on, on the company and the role was, um, you know, they're very much, Veracode is very much about what can we do to, to help grow um, and provide you with, with the, like, the, the latest and greatest and to keep you, you know, happy, keep you learning. And um, that's going to effectively help you in, in growing your career. Um, and people who, you know, did maybe have done your job in the past and have moved on, will will take time to, to meet with you and kind of review everything and help you um, they'll go out of their way to make sure that you're successful because I think that at the end of the day, um, Ver Verico can only be successful if, if all of their employees are successful. Um, I've been pretty impressed with the, with 
with the community at Veracode and how supportive they, they all are. Um, I've never seen a team or someone put someone else down for, for something that you're working on. And I think that's, that's pretty rare. Um, so. Yeah, very nice. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit about your tips for someone who's interviewing. Now, I'm assuming these are tips for someone interviewing at Veracode, but if they're not, um, let us know. Um, what would you, like, let's expand on some of these, because I feel like share your passion can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Yeah, I think um, share your passion. It could be both actually, I would say professionally and personally, but I think it's important because of that environment that we're kind of describing that collective support and um, collaborative organization that we have is that you're excited to work for Veracon. What's your, like you have enthusiasm. You're not just coming here. You're going to do a job and just check off a list of your tasks, what have you, but that you're actually, you know, want to be part of the bigger picture and help things, help your peers build those relationships because we see a lot more, you know, business success, but employee happiness that way. So sharing that, um, you know, really, I, you know, I interview, I have a team, I'm in staffing. And so interviewing, like, I, I really do see a difference in candidates and my, you know, excitement towards them based somewhat on their excitement towards us as well. Yeah. yeah. I think, you know, uh, to add to that too, is um, we interview, obviously, you know, we want someone that's qualified to, to do the job that, you know, but more than that, I think we interview for a culture fit, right? So that passion, um, that, that really tells a lot in an interview, at least in my experience, um, you know, having someone come in and, and know what Veracode is, even if they don't know that all the details of Veracode, but know what Veracode is and share that excitement. Like this, this is a great company, the, the growth potential here, um, that goes a lot further than, um, you know, to what Mel was saying, you know, I, I have, you know, all of these years experience and I can check off the box for this, this, and this, um, because it shows us that they, you know, they want to be part of the, the company and the culture as much as they want to do um, that specific job or role. Yeah, I love that. Um, that's, that's really great advice. Thank you for sharing that with our community. Um, so I'm going to switch to our next slide here. And this has um, got some information about a lot of the currently open roles with Veracode. Um, now, when it, we when we look at this list, I know there's a ton of things on here. And we had talked a little bit earlier about jobs that you have, that you guys are still, you know, you're eager, eager to hire for, but the recs maybe haven't been written yet. Um, let's talk a little bit about those. You know, um, what, what, what kind of roles are you looking at, um, you know, outside of what's already posted with Veracode, what kind of roles are you, are you looking at coming down the pipe? Sure. Yeah. Like jobs in general right now are roles that are open for the, a few of them in marketing as sales as well. So we work really closely with all of these roles. Um, but I do have a, marketing project management role that I am just starting to define and work on a job description. So that role will be somebody um, that reports to me on my marketing operations team to support the department in terms of project and program management. So if we have a large event or a large analyst report or some kind of initiative coming up, that person would be responsible for facilitating that project through its life cycle, making sure all the various stakeholders understand what needs to be done, how we need to support it, when it needs to be done to make sure we um, successfully deliver as well as managing a project management tool. So right now we have JIRA as our project management tool. We're open to evaluation, but they would be responsible for that technology as well. Okay. Um, all right, so we are at time today, um, but I just wanna say a huge thank you to both Laura and Melanie. Um, there's a lot of work that goes into these chats that more than just what you see um, during the hour we spend with you. So I just wanna say a huge thank you to you both um, as well as Tavera Code for lending you to us for the afternoon. Um, thank you both so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I also want to extend a big thank you to our attendees. Um, the questions that y'all submitted ahead of today's session were absolutely great. I'm so sorry we weren't able to get to all of them, um, but I did see um, Lauren, or sorry, I did see some people in the chat answering questions, so that was so great. Thank you. Um, hopefully we will see many more of you join us on events coming up in the future. We've got, um, next week is our, our September mini summit it runs from the 20th to the 23rd. It is focused on 
mid-career pivoters and uh, the campus connection. So people who are maybe recent graduates and looking for jobs. Um, so hopefully y'all will come join us for that. But if not, we've got a ton of other free events happening on um, multiples later this week, as well as um, in two weeks. So hopefully we'll see, see many more of you around. Um, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your Tuesday and uh, can't wait to see you in the future on, uh, on future events. Thanks everybody, bye.